Hello and welcome to the Drunk and Delirious podcast. My name is sowas wie ein Fan and I wanted to do something like this for a long time now. Actually, the very first time I thought about this, I was talking to a friend of mine who is also a streamer, Selsam Hawkeye, who wanted to do this with me. That's where the Delirious part comes from because she's tired a lot and she's not drinking too much. So I was going to be the drunk part and she's the Delirious part. And I kind of fell through and it's kind of hard to organize nice and also it's kind of a pain to for one I don't want to deliberately just make myself drunk just for a podcast that seems very unhealthy to me I'm a firm believer that whenever you are enjoying alcohol you should do it in the moment you should enjoy and you shouldn't regret afterwards so know your limits don't drink and drive and all that jazz yeah just basically drink safely with know your limits and enjoy the moment i hate to just get drunk for a specific purpose if i feel like i want to get drunk or i i just crave a beer or something then i go do that but i would hate to just think to myself that you know i want to crack out another one of these uh, drunken podcasts so i'm just going to drink myself into a state of incredible drunkenness and then do that i i feel like that adds too much pressure to something that you should do entirely for enjoyment so yeah i'm not going to keep a specific upload schedule for these podcasts whenever i have like an opportunity where i'm just incredibly drunk and also uh, just want to plop myself in front of a mic and basically see how long i can ramble on in my second language then i'm going to do that and today was one of these situations i just came home from a friend's birthday party and it was a maceballs there was a lot of drinks there are a lot of different drinks i'm going to put a list of exactly what i did drink because i actually kept that in mind in the description so you can check out my actual level of drunkenness and how much i did drink and what i did drink so yeah take a look at the description and you know exactly my level right now uh, also funny story related to that the brother of the friend that had the birthday party brought his uh, girlfriend along and i was drinking vodka at the time which is like vodka and vodmaster combined it's like a little green liquor thing and she didn't know it so she asked me what it was i said you know want to try it and she said sure so i poured her a little shot glass you drink those out of those little shot glasses she tried it and she loved it she was like oh my god this tastes amazing there was an entire bottle of it the very first one was like almost empty so um we emptied that and she wanted more so she got the full bottle and we kept drinking it and kind of the goal was to empty that bottle because she really enjoyed that liquor and she always asked for one more so i happily obliged and then she excused herself to the toilet and then i didn't see her again for the rest of the day until like an hour afterwards where she was just like passed out in one of the bedrooms so i just i came to realize that without planning to or actually realizing it i actually filled up a, a woman and just you know kind of drank her under the table basically and that kind of made me feel amazing a little bit because she always wanted more i didn't i i didn't have any reason to feel guilty about it she wanted more and if she didn't know her limits at least she knows them now so uh, i think she learned something from it i hope at least and uh yeah t if you are listening to this right now don't feel pressured into drinking you can always say uh i'm going to need a break or i'm at my limits and usually if people aren't assholes about it they are going to respect that i would have respected it but she kept on going and she was completely passed out so i kind of feel cool about myself now knowing that i drank a person under the table without even trying so that's something that happened and then i came home and i decided to plop myself in front of a mic and just kind of keep a recording going and see how long i can go and that's basically the gist of the drunk and delirious podcast so i hope you enjoy i'm just going to basically this completely unscripted and unprepared so i'm just going to ramble on a bunch of topics until i'm running out of things to talk about um, first thing I can kind of talk about is the Eurovision Song Contest. Now, I'm going to be very specific about this. There is a Discord group that I'm in where I'm actually, um, at this point, I'm an admin for that Discord group, which is the JC Discord, the Hylians. I think I can say that. And they host a watch-along using Rabbit at the moment 
we don't know yet what we're going to use once rabbit is out of business but we are aware that rabbit is going out of business so we're looking at alternatives anyway that's beside the point basically they are having a watch along i decided i want to host a eurovision watch along because eurovision is like this big european single competition that's like known for all these incredible production values and really weird entries and just all around a great time and a lot of american people don't know about it yet so i'm always glad to show it to someone who doesn't know it and get them into the hype you know because i love it I, every year i'm just very interested to see what's brought to the table usually you're going to find something new to love and appreciate and for for me as a music collector it's always just a blast to kind of sit back and see all those great performances and really go wild basically so we did two of those eurovision watch along so far uh, one was the 2010 one which i started started with because germany won that one which is my country and i kind of want to present ourselves from the best side possible considering how much germany's entries suck sometimes so i wanted to basically put our best foot forward and start with the year which lena won and everyone loves lena and everyone who was in that watch along loved lena and she came back for the 2011 one so i i decided you know what what you what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with 2010 we're going to do it chronologically until we watch 2019 which is the current one at the time of this recording and then once we did that everyone who is still in this watch along group is going to be so into eurovision that i can show them the very first one and then go up chronologically from there uh, until we caught up to 2010 and then we're gonna watch the semi-finals and stuff like that i'm going to i'm planning to get them really into it at this point we had two of them 2010 and 2011 and the general consensus is that the 2010 contest was way stronger than the 2011 contest and i tend to agree for one, 2011 was weird uh, so far that a lot of the countries were on really equal level. It's not that, like, every year there's going to be, like, stronger and weaker entries, even in the final. And that was the case in 2011 as well, but the margin of that was way smaller. There wasn't, like, an amazing entrant. There were some really good ones, don't get me wrong, there were some great ones there, but nothing mind-blowingly amazing. Even the song that eventually won was just a very weak win uh, point-wise. And in general, watching the points was really interesting that year, because... It took until like the third to last uh, jury's votes until we knew who won because the points went pretty much everywhere and even the second to last place had an amazing amount of points which is basically unheard of. Uh, the statistic I seen in that regard was that the second to last place in 2011 had about as many points as the 13th place in the year before. And that's just insane. That's insane. That's absolutely insane. So, yeah, that was kind of cool to watch. But the actual entries, most of which were kind of middle of the road. And even the ones that I liked, if I were to compare them to the ones that I liked in 2010, were weaker, I would say, in general. And, yeah, that, I would agree with the general consensus that 2010 was a stronger year. Lena competed again. She did amazing. Two top 10 in a row is pretty amazing. Uh, not a lot of people can say that they did that. And uh, we are to this day very proud of her achievement in that regard. The halftime show or basically the intermission act wasn't as great though. Jan Delay was pretty underwhelming and I, I hate his voice anyway. I don't think he's that great of a singer or musician or even that great of an entertainer. And I was really the uh, Cold Steel intermission act of the first semi-final would have been way better. Because that's like this big ass drum group which has is like a little bit military in their presentation. But then they do all these really cool theatrics and dance moves combined with like their drumming. And it's really amazing to watch. Even though that is nothing but drumming it was really engaging and really cool and if that was the interval act of the grand final i think it would have been way more memorable than whatever jan delay was doing but yeah that's basically my consensus uh, or, or my opinion on eurovision 2011 versus 2010 i would still think that it, uh, i would still say that it would be at least worth to watch once if you're already into eurovision it would be a terrible first impression. I, I would also say that. But if you want a really good first impression of Eurovision, I would say watch the 2018 one. That was by far one of the strongest years when it comes to musical quality and, and performances and everything. 
2018 was an amazing year for Eurovision. So, yeah, that's basically everything I wanted to talk about when it comes to Eurovision. Next topic. Ooh, what do I want to talk about next? If you follow my Twitter, you might have seen, or even if you follow my YouTube channel, you might have seen how many videos I recently put out. And my video output is really strange, right? Because I have like these very long gaps and then I just upload a ton of long form content and I'm gone again. That's basically because my channel exists for nobody but myself, really. I'm really glad that people watching it and enjoy it, but the, the mindset that I I went about it is it doesn't matter how many people actually watch it or subscribe or anything because my goal with that thing is to make stuff that I can look back on and be proud of even if it's like drunken rants like that I'm 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 thinking that those are preserving moments of my life and doing it in a way where I maybe get something out of it in the future reminding myself of a mindset I had or something like that so when I look at my channel no matter what video I go on even the very first ones that are cringy and that are hard to watch for myself I can kind of be proud of everything that I, I see there even the info videos really it's a relic of my time and I'm really glad to have that and it, it's not like the insane output and long form content can be a slog to watch I, I totally get it especially when I'm like having these these multi hour long reaction videos to E3 a month late after E3 already happened. And the reason for that basically is that the uh, E3 reaction streams were basically like, especially on day two, that day two was like a seven hour VOD. And cutting that up and rendering every individual part out so that I can have one episode for every conference and then cutting those up, especially the um, the talking before and after, where like the people that I was were talking with are maybe not having something to say or they muted themselves to eat or they went up to go to the loo or to get a drink or something or they just didn't have anything to say so there was an awkward silence um, especially when there wasn't any active chat or something and stuff like that you know maybe someone stumbled a bunch of times so I cut that out or I'm, I'm talking about the stream numbers or what I'm going to do later on in the stream which is totally irrelevant for someone who's watching the video on YouTube so I cut those parts out so there was a lot of things to uh, just find and cut out and for four of those videos I needed to do it twice actually because for those that didn't know I, I used a VSDC free video editor which is a program that is not great for editing but if you just want to cut something up for further use down the line it's really good at preparing stuff basically and in case of these E3 bots there's not too much fancy editing I actually wanted to do actually nothing at all so I was content with just cutting it up, rendering it out, and then once everything is done, start to upload those. However, because I, I guess the program couldn't really handle the seven hour VOD, it died a couple of times, four times in fact, and I needed to cut four of these parts twice. And this is already in addition to sitting down for multiple hours, skimming through the talk footage, find the parts that are worthy of being cut out, the long pauses, whatever it is, right? And that all, is uh, then on, on top of rendering times so take, which take my bandwidth and which time I couldn't do streaming I couldn't do too many stuff that requires internet connection of any kind then on top of that you add that my D drive died so I have only one hard drive and my external drive to work with uh, so I'm having to play file Tetris with, with really big files because those video files are massive especially the uh, the VODs that I downloaded off of Twitch especially the 7 hour one so all of these problems combined just added up to made me like a, a month too late which will cost me like an insane amount of euros compared to if I just uploaded them I immediately but if I did that they would be as good to watch the the point of cutting that much out of it was to make it a coherent thing to watch on on YouTube a coherent discussion beforehand then for the most part completely uncut reactions to the actual press conferences and then again very precise precisely cut uh, discussions of what just happened afterwards that also needed to be coherent so that's basically what took me so long with those and now that they're all done I I've just kind of made it a point to upload three of them a day so that I can be done within a week and that's why after like this long silence there's suddenly a flood of really long videos I think I addressed that in enough detail or about as much detail as needed in, in that case I just hope that maybe a year or two down the line it's interesting for people to 
to go back and see what I said about those uh, games that were announced back when they were first announced. I think that's really the point of preserving those. And yeah, that's also why I made a playlist. Basically, I'm also going to include the podcast where I talked about all of E3 uh, in the playlist, even though that's not a video I made, uh, but I was guesting in it. So it, it's, a, it's a video featuring me and I actually took a, a lot of the discussion. I uh, led a lot of the discussion even. So it's like the perfect way to cut off or to end the playlist on. The entire thing is just my reactions to it and then you have like the big podcast of me talking about everything, giving my final grades and then having other people's perspectives on everything as well. Plus a couple of extra talking points that I didn't really address too much in my own words, even though I think I mentioned some of it beforehand. So yeah, that's basically the point of the playlist. It's basically you can just start the playlist, lean back and have like my reactions for hours on end. Or you can just jump to specific stuff that interests you. I always try to make it a point in my long form content that you can somehow skip to parts that are in particular of your interest, right? Because that's just, if I'm sitting down and have a multiple hour podcast, then I kind of want to have the topics with timestamps in the description so that you can skip topics that you don't care about at all, unless you just have me on in the background anyways, at which point it doesn't matter, but at least you have the option of skip stuff that doesn't interest you. And with those E3 awards, uh, you can skip something like um, limited run games, which I know very few people actually care about. And me and Zyrim watched that, enjoying the limited run games presentation of the year beforehand. So we were kind of like the... I felt like we were the only people actually excited to see what Limited Run were bringing to the table, even though we are not very uh, hyped for any particular announcements that they might have. So it was a bit weird, but I, I still think that it's worthwhile to do. And I'm glad that I did it. And I also glad that I did the AMD one, even though I had no idea about hardware. And thankfully there was one guy who made a bunch of comments in the AMD one specifically to correct me on stuff or tell me about something that I probably should have known about but didn't. And he was really helpful. Or or she. I don't really know what it is. Could be a he or she, I won't judge. Uh, anyway, that this person took a time of, of, out of their day to actually watch it and multiple comments in my comment section, some of which were really long. And I answered all of them as best as I could and then he, answer, he or she answered on some of them again. That's basically the status of it. Um, I'm really thankful for that person, honestly. And I would wish, like, this is always always the kind of discussion I would love to have in my comment section, but it's just that there I, I didn't do too much to really grow actively, and if passively I slouch too much. Like, those multiple month-long breaks, almost year-long breaks between videos are almost certainly killing my channel more so than they're helping it. So I am, of course, the only person guilty for not growing my channel as much as I probably could have. I know in theory what I needed to do to grow my channel. It's just that I never really intended my channel to be something big. Like I said earlier, I made it mostly for myself to kind of have a creative outlet if I want to do something creative or just like info dump my opinions in a format where it makes sense. Like this format is just for fun. Like sitting a drunk person in front of a microphone and letting him ramble on is fun. I, I don't know where this will be going. I don't know if when I listen to this sober because I will have to listen to this sober to cut this audio file because there are certainly a lot of long pauses and ams and erms that I need to cut out. So I am going to have to listen to this sober and I am not sure what my reaction to any of what I'm saying will be. It's not like I'm an embarrassing drunk or anything. If anything, I get more philosophical when I'm drunk. I'm that kind of drunk. So I, I'm thinking that this will be probably interesting. That's kind of what gave me the final push, basically, to decide, you know what, I'm just going to do it and see what happens. Yeah, but enough about that. Another thing that I you might have noticed if you follow my uh, Twitter specifically is that I linked a video of Yong Ye, who um, basically the Jinquisition dug out a presentation uh, about 20 minutes long of a guy who basically told people from the industry, of the gaming industry, how to best monetize their games, i.e. he highlighted the psychological manipulation that goes on in those games, and he even gave them tips on how to e be even more egregious, how to even more psychologically manipulate your player base into spending money. And it's like, it's a revolting watch. It's like disgusting how much thought those companies put into gamming you out of your money. 
And EA likes, especially EA, likes to feign ignorance about this stuff. We think it's quite fun and that players like surprises and those uh, loot boxes are actually quite ethical. Bullshit, they don't be believe that. They are just trying to save their asses in front of people who could actually stop them, i.e. the law. They don't care about us, they want our money and they don't see us as people. And that doesn't only go for EA, that goes for all of the AAA industry. Even Ubisoft, who made, who cleaned up their act a little bit, but like little things like how they went about those custom created levels in Assassin's Creed that were designed for you to quickly rack up experience so that you don't have to buy the experience boosters that they sell. The way that they handled that showed that they are actually still anti-consumer. They're just masking it really well. So yeah, I am not intent of letting AAA people off the hook. I'm not going to give people like Activision or EA the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to go harsh on them whenever they do anything anti-consumer and epic as well and that's because they don't deserve my mercy or they don't deserve my second doubts or they they don't deserve any leeway I would possibly offer them they don't deserve it plain and simple because if I gave them a little inch they would not only take a mile they would they would take the whole street chop it up into chunks and sell it back to me in packets that's what they would do and they would be grinning from ear to ear while doing it. So yeah, they are just disgusting wastes of flesh, basically. I mean, if I, I'm, I'm talking about the company as a whole, so basically it's just an empty husk that swallows up money indefinitely. That's what a company is. The only worthless pieces of flesh are actually the CEOs who, who make way more money than they deserve, like multiple millions too many. They, they get more money than they could ever spend no matter what their lifestyle is. People like Andrew Wilson and Bobby Kotick are really disgusting human beings, completely lacking empathy. They could absolutely fund video game development of entire multi-million dollar gaming projects from their own pockets without the studio even spending a single dime could still pay the workers from their own pockets and wouldn't even feel the impact of it. But they of course don't do it because all they want is even more money and exploit their workers, exploit their customers and laugh all the way to the bank. It's disgusting. The, the system is broken and it's terrible and I hate it. So yeah, they don't deserve anything. They don't deserve my mercy. I will give them as much bad press as I can possibly justify. I don't want to like misreport stuff because if I would do something that's unjustified, then I would give them the opportunity to play the victim and they don't deserve that either. They are absolutely not the victim. If anything, they are a wolf in sheep's clothing and I, I cannot let that happen. So if I'm a bit harsh maybe, or if I appear a little bit harsh to you about certain kinds of practices or something that's because they don't deserve any other treatment and that's absolutely how i'm going to handle this i'm going to shed light on everything anti-consumer activision ea even blizzard and ubisoft do because they deserve nothing else and i would urge every single one of you to watch this talk this 20 minute talk or at least young years video of it where he basically talks about the most important parts he does give a quick summary of everything that is mentioned in the talk, but he basically focuses on a, on a few key parts and he explains it in layman's terms. So even if you have no good grasp of like terminology in English, especially when it comes to business terminology, you can still watch Young Yeah's video and he'll make it very clear what they are actually saying. So it's absolutely worthwhile watching. I think that just knowledge is power and you absolutely owe it to yourself to know about these practices that the AAA industry uses to scam you out of your money and you deserve to be smarter than them. You deserve not to be cheated out of your money and easiest way to guarantee that you're not cheated out of your money by those companies is just to know what their schemes are. And you should, you absolutely should because no matter where you look in the AAA gaming industry, there is no game that doesn't implement them in any way at the moment. No matter what AAA game you buy for full price, $60, they will have other purchases in them and they are 
psychologically implemented in a way that they are manipulating certain kinds of players. If you don't feel like they're manipulating you, that doesn't excuse them because they are not targeting you. So yeah, it's just disgusting. And you should know about that and you should be, you know, you should be prepared, basically. I personally stopped playing AAA games altogether. I completely removed myself from that industry, as at least when it comes to my personal gaming. I still like keep tabs on the industry. I still keep up with the news and everything that's happening because I want to bring that shit to light. I'm not a big platform for stuff like that. I don't have a big reach for information like that but even if I can convince a single person not to spend money on microtransactions that they don't need just made to feel like they want and I, I can make it so that they don't buy those or better yet yeah, don't even buy the game that those are part of then that's a victory for me and that's absolutely justifies this whole podcast as a whole doesn't it I, I feel like it does music industry isn't any better by the way and as a music collector that's a very sad fact for me but maybe I should talk about the music industry in its own little podcast thingy because that's a really big topic and I think I should even when I'm drunk I should do at least a little bit of preparation for this so I don't misrepresent facts Uh, in this case I watched a video that I just mentioned like two hours well no I was still on a on the party for from two hours ago but like basically before i went to the party this video was the last thing i watched so it's very fresh in my mind and i don't feel like i'm misrepresenting anything here it's literally just calling what i saw when it comes to the music industry there are really big names involved and i don't want to misname anyone uh, or accuse artists that maybe are just victims of the system rather than uh, actually like perpetrators of it i guess what else happened there was this kyoto animation fire which is just a tragedy 33 animators died people that just wanted to make anime to make the life of other people better and they died for it and it's just terrible and horrible and the person who did it of course lit himself on fire probably also dead absolutely deserved that in my opinion like i feel like that person was dead set on dying anyway for a very petty reason might i add they basically accused kyoto animation of stealing their idea so they lit themselves on fire spread gasoline and then just killed 33 people and that's just disgusting that's just terrible that's on one level with ea i mean realistically it's way below ea you get my point it's abhorrent in a different way if that makes sense the loss of life is of course terrible but i feel like robbing a bunch of people of their money that they might need to exist is a prolonged form of killing as well um especially because they do that willingly and knowingly anyway i'm getting back to those triple a guys man i want to talk about the cure anything Not too much, because that person doesn't deserve too much attention for what he did. I think it's a good thing that the Japanese police doesn't leak the identity of that person, only, like, rough details. Whereas when something like that happens in America, you have, like, the face and the name all over the news. And I feel like that's just, on on the part of the news system, that's just the wrong message. That gets your name out of there, out there, and it probably inspires other people to do terrible crimes like that, to just to get their name and face out there, to be known. Because that's a desire for a lot of people, to be known. Not everyone can deal with the level of fame once they get it. Fame is an interesting concept because a lot of people want it, but once they have it, they realize how terrible it is. So, it's just insane that something so terrible that a lot of people recognize as terrible once they get it is something that a lot of people are actually willing to do a lot of terrible shit for and the news shouldn't support this ideology at all i think the japanese news system not revealing the name and face of the guy who did it is the absolute right way to do it and so everyone can just focus on the tragedy of kyoani themselves and the people that died there without deserving it and the fundraisers that came out and in in less than a day completely smashing the goal were really heartwarming in amidst all the tragedy it really shows how much the anime community cares and how much of a wonderful community the anime community is as a whole sure it like complains a lot but if you compla- compare it to like the wrestling fandom who complain way more and the video game fandom who are downright cynical for the most part i i should know because i'm both a wrestling fan and a video gamer so i sure do a lot of complaining and compared to that the anime community is like smaller but way more pure of course there are purists that are like way elitist about their beliefs and 
shouldn't be and all of those kinds but those pricks are in every fandom that has anything to do with art there are always like these elitist pricks that feel like the art that they are into is the superior art and everything else is lesser art and only the pricks don't understand uh what's great about their art and you know stuff like that i don't need to get into it because you probably met a guy like that in the fandom that you are in and those guys are always like the people that no one wants and they should really realize that you should have an open mind as someone who is a big music collector i understand the importance of having an open mind when it comes to music not only because you get to experience a lot of different things that you just would never have encountered if you were to stick to like a couple of genres but also that you can just kind of see how shit uh, popular music is at the moment that has nothing to do with being open-minded if you listen to the billboard charts right now you will see that like 80 percent at the very least is total trash produced in a very same cheap way with no soul in it music as a product basically with only a few exceptions like billy eilish is someone who i would regard as someone who is doing it for the art you can see it in her music videos those are really well thought out visually interesting are very interestingly tied to the song itself and the song itself is done in a very creative way as opposed to everything else that you listen to even though it's also a very subdued bassy kind of songwriting with very minimal approach and stuff like that you know i could probably explain it a lot better if i was sober right now but for right now that's what you get anyway what m my point is that billy eilish is great and a lot of the rest of the charts is just the very same terrible drab like how long was old town road on like the top of the charts for no other reason than it's a weird mashup and everyone was weirdly into it it wasn't even a good mashup like yeah it wasn't completely garbage like a lot of the other stuff in the billboard charts is but at the same time it wasn't that great though was it i could appreciate trying a fusion of that kind but it wasn't even the first fusion of that kind so yeah it wasn't like a baby metal kind of thing baby metal was weird in that it took some again Having Japanese pop and metal at coexist wasn't like an incredibly new thing. It was done before. But Baby Metal was the first one to really take idol as, a, as an ideology, basically. The entire idol way of doing things and put that in a metal band and completely run with it. If you listen to that first album, there are a lot of clashing ideas that just were made to work. Because the guy that writes the music is an absolute perfectionist and he, I feel like he just wanted to have as many weird style clashes as possible and just set himself the challenge to try to make it work and he succeeded. And the second album is even more great in that respect because I feel like it's even more tightly constructed and I'm really interested to see the third album and see where that goes. So yeah, Baby Matter, big cool thing that came out of like 2014 onwards i mean it, they exist like 2012 or something or 2010 i forgot when they were formed i'm terrible with numbers but yeah um baby metal is great i love them i saw them live i didn't regret it i saw uh, them live while yui was still in the group love yui to death and uh, the other two are great as well especially suzuka who has fantastic vocals i'm actually not sure how i'm going to do the timestamps for this video because i'm just completely rambling on and hopping from topic to topic maybe i need to do like very tightly constructed timestamps which are just going to be a blast to look at i'm sure you're going to see something when you look in the description i'm sure i'm like i said earlier i'm very adamant of people having to find specific parts that they are enjoying watching so I'm going to make something and make it work. What else could I talk about? Um, I think I've reached the point of running out of things to say. So I'm just thinking this is a very natural place for the podcast to stop. For the for very first installment, I think this was a good run. Uh, once I'm sober, I'm going to see how I'm feeling about it. Then I'm going to cut out weird awkward pauses and ams and ums. And then I'm sh I should come out at about almost 40 minutes, I think. So I, I'm not sure how, how long the pauses are and how much I need to cut out of this. But I should come out to like 38 to 40 minutes, some, somewhere in that vicinity, maybe a little bit less. Which I think is a good length for a first time. If you like this, let me know what I should do better. Maybe should I prepare a little bit while I'm drunk? Would that improve the formula for you? Or should I just do the same thing like I did today and just plot myself completely unprepared in front of a mic and just see where my train of thought leads me? Let me know! 
and let me know how you like my drunk self. All right. Uh, am I the kind of drunk you would like to share a beer with? Yes or no? That's the kind of questions that bother me or interest me when I'm drunk, I guess. So yeah, this was the very first Drunk and Delirious podcast and I uh, see you next time. Have a good day.